we've got this big divide between data digital native companies like Google and other companies from older industries for whom analytics is just a support function. So can you elaborate on this big divide and what could be done to close that gap? I always like to tell people, if, you are, if you're going to ever take up a position, try and go to a company where your job is one of the most valued jobs out there. The, the level of technical skills necessary to break into the industry are relatively low, actually. And so I really couch my videos in like those terms. What can you do? Like what skills can you learn to quickly build up your ability to get a job? And then when you're in the job, that, that's the best practice you can possibly get. Shashank, welcome to the Super Data Science Podcast. I've been watching your YouTube videos a lot lately. And so now I'm excited to be able to interact with you uh, in this virtual recording. Where in the world are you calling in from? Uh, thanks for having me here, John. I'm calling in from Seattle, Washington right now. Oh, uh, yeah, nice. And uh, in the video recording, we've got a beautiful view out your window as the sun comes up. When we first uh, joined on this call, it was kind of dark out there. Um, so thank you for very early in the morning uh, agreeing to do this call to squeeze it in before your workday. I understand that you're not much of a morning person. No, no, I am not, unfortunately. Um, it, I, I find it very easy to stay up until 4 a.m., but very difficult to wake up before, <laughs> before 9, quite honestly. There you go. Well, the sacrifices that you're making for the Super Data Science audience, I'm sure they appreciate it out there. Um, so we know each other through Ken G, who was in episode number 555 of the Super Data Science podcast. Um, Ken, obviously an iconic character in the data science community. He leads a great content creator uh, agency. Um, and so that helps um, get you know, big ad campaigns distributed across um, a broad range of different social media uh, channels at once, which is awesome. That company's called Learn Media. They're doing great work. And Ken also has an enormous YouTube channel. And maybe that's how you two connected initially because of your enormous YouTube channel. How did you guys meet initially? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, he reached out to me, I believe. And that's how we uh, met. I, I think he reached out to me for uh, Ken's Nearest Neighbors. Right, the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast, which uh, I can definitely recommend. He's had a lot of great guests on the show. And uh, yeah, I've actually reached out to him a couple of times now to say, who are some of the best guests you've ever had on Ken's Nearest Neighbors? And Shashank, that's how you ended up on the podcast today. Oh, it's an honor to, it's an honor to hear that. Uh, actually, I'll be on his podcast again. Um, you know, you'll probably see it around the time of this recording as well. Oh, nice. Um, looking forward to checking that out as well. So uh, your YouTube channel has over 100,000 subscribers, which is crazy. And on that channel, you teach primarily about data analytics to aspiring and beginning data analysts. What motivated you initially to start your channel and teach about data analytics? That's a good question, honestly. So um, it really started, I mean, a long time ago, right? So I used to work at uh, Interstate Batteries uh, back in 2018 to 2020, I believe. Um, they're... North America's largest distributor of lead-acid batteries, basically car batteries. And I was working on an analytics team and supply chain over there. And then we noticed that it was difficult to get the uh, get Tableau adoption um, in the company because people just didn't know how Tableau worked. And so um, I, luckily, my director and my boss were both very supportive of me. And they helped me. Uh, I, I created a Tableau course, taught it to the company, um, and just kind of had that material ready. Then 20, March 2020 comes along pandemic starts. And then uh, the company my mom uh, worked at at the time was like their whole business model was basically just invalidated. They did um, uh, events and stuff like that. Right. So, I mean, you know, you, you have zero revenue for two years, basically. Right. Um, and so un unfortunately, she got for, uh, furloughed, um, you know, no fault of her own, just, it, you know, wrong place at the wrong time. What are you going to do? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not, you know, no one blames the company. W what else were they supposed to do? Um, so I was like, okay, well, what I learned was that having Tableau skills, right? Um, just having Tableau skills was enough to drive a pretty solid amount of value at the company I was at at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I took that, you know, the basic materials I had, I turned them into a video, put them on YouTube and like, you know, taught my mom. I was like, hey, here's how like Tableau works. Uh, now you can put it on your resume. I tell most people you can learn Tableau on, in a weekend, quite honestly. It's, it, it's meant to be easy to use. Um, right. So also a pro tip to, for anyone that's working in like BI or BA over there, because um, I used to work in BI. 
it is uh, if you are fighting with Tableau to get something done and getting it's taking a long time to get something done. Mm-hmm. That probably is not the best way to do it. It's supposed to be an easy to use tool, right. um, but they want you to use it a very specific way. So right. uh, I would do everything to use it that way because it's not worth fighting with Tableau. Mm-hmm. BI is business intelligence, right? Yes, sir. Got it. Um, so, all right. So you were inspired to create your channel by this situation that happened with your mom, that you, like this opportunity to teach her Tableau. So you like created some videos, or you created a video course or something. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of like part one of the story, right? And then for a year, I didn't really post anything after that. Um, Then I was watching Ali Abdal one day, and he's like, you know, if you want to get on YouTube, just get on YouTube. He had this video where he literally said, just get on YouTube. He's like, just put something out there. And I was watching this at like 10 p.m. at night. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I'm not literally going to do something right now. I'll wake up in the morning and I'll do something. So Mm -hmm. I woke up the next morning. I um, went ahead and kind of showed, like, I just did this video where I parsed out SurveyMonkey data in Python. that I had to do for a client because I did independent consulting at the time. I was one of those two jobs people during the pandemic. Um, uh, n- not a bad gig. It was I, I liked it. I don't, I don't regret it at all, quite honestly. Um, but uh, went ahead and just showed myself actually doing that. And I titled the video "Dane: The Life of a Data Analyst." Um, uh-huh. And uh-huh. It, <laughs> that it was video, kind of a, that video has two million views. Two point yeah, one million yeah. views at the time of recording. That's wild. Launched it's the only entire a year channel. Old. That was your. That was one of your first uploads. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. I, I, you know, and it was like, like I was obviously like, th- there was a little bit of thought put into it. The, the basic thought was, um, so back in like 2015, 2017, uh, Mayuko, Joma Tech, these like, you know, really big YouTubers, they kind of said like day in the life of a data scientist, day in the life of a software engineer. Uh, and back then, you know, seeing the day in the life of a uh, FANG company. So, you know, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, uh, Netflix, Google. I refuse to call Facebook Meta. It's a dumb name, but um, <laughs> uh, the um, they, they used to work at those companies, right? And they would like show like a day in their life, and it, it was pretty cool. Um, but then what happened was people started to realize that you could get just a ton of views by just doing that, being like, "Hey, I don't actually do, do any work. Here's my coffee machine. Here's my like all the cool stuff that Google gives us," um, mm-hmm. and then not show any actual work. And so this video was a bit of a shot at uh, the newer versions of those videos. Um, Again, if you're the first to do something, it's pretty cool. But, you know, if you're, you know, number 10,000 in a line of 100,000 people waiting to do something, then right. you know, I, I don't really see the value being added. Um, everyone knows that FANG employees are some of the best treated employees in America right now. Uh, we we, we want to see the work that you do. So that was kind of how that video came about. Cool. Well, so 2 million views well. is all luck. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a... Uh, I've released a lot of videos and I have, <laughs> I don't think all of my videos together are at a fraction of 2 million. That's, uh, I mean, to some extent it's luck, but it also is, you know, you thought about what kinds of videos are getting traction and you created this video as a specific uh, statement, an antidote to those kinds of fang videos. So there was a good insight behind there. It's not just luck. And obviously there had to be uh, some high quality in there um, in order to have that get such a, a big audience. So you must have, um, or you do have, I can say, a uh, an innate ability to identify high quality uh, video content. You know, you have, you've got a good sense for the art. All right, so back to your story about how you got started before that 2 million view video where you were talking about creating that Tableau course. Um, do you think that anybody who's out of work could become an analyst? Should anyone who's out of work become an analyst? So as far as like, can anyone do it? I think anyone can do it. If you want to do it, you can definitely do it. Uh, and, and this isn't just me saying that. If you want to be, if you want to be in the NBA, you can't do it. You know, like like <laughs> desire is not enough. Um, right. If you want to be a PhD level scientist, ninety nine percent of you do not have the capabilities to do so. Myself included. You know, um, the, so I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm not just BSing you here and saying, oh yeah, if you have the willpower, you can do it. No, no, this is actually something that you can do um, because it is. Um, the, the level of technical skills necessary to break into the industry are relatively low, actually. Um, I teach a boot camp where we do hammer in like Python and SQL and uh, Tableau and stuff like that. But we um, that's kind of to overprepare people. But as far as if anyone wants to do it, they totally can do it. Now, should anyone do it? <laughs> I kind of feel like basic Tableau skills or, you know, BI skills, so Power BI, same thing. Yeah. Uh, again, given that you can learn it in a weekend, um, I believe it benefits almost everyone who works a knowledge um, job. A, what do they call knowledge economy job? Right. Because 
you would be surprised how many decisions are made in corporate America. I mean, you know, just given corporate America is my experience that don't involve any or much um, rigorous uh, analysis of data. And if you're the first person to bring in that rigorous analysis of data through, you know, just a BI tool, basically, uh, which allows you to uh, measure your metrics on a regular cadence uh, and allows you to transform data in interesting ways and present it to people so that they may understand the insights that you have. Um, as long as you, it, it, the ability to do that is something that's going to accelerate your career in the industry. So I, I'm a believer that BI skills, I think everyone should know. Um, basic SQL is helpful to a lot of people. Uh, the number of business people I know who know SQL are very, very low. Uh, but the ones that do uh, are always able to get access to databases because engineers and analysts are too busy to run every single query that could possibly be run. So eventually everyone just gets frustrated and they're like, okay, here's database access. Go like, you know, run your own queries. Uh, and mm -hmm. again, you're then as a business person, you're able to, you know, run the kinds of analysis, the analysis that your uh, coworkers can't do. Right. Uh, and you make yourself more useful. Yeah. It's, it's just a weekend. Exactly. Exactly. You can learn, um, maybe not SQL, but you can learn Tableau in a weekend easy, you know? Yeah. That is an awesome tip. Um, and so your YouTube channel actually is filled <laughs> with tips. So even though it's only been a year since you started creating a lot of content, there are a lot of videos there. You've got tips for data analysts, obviously, as we've already discussed. So things like resume advice, interview prep advice. Mm -hmm. um, you have chapter walkthroughs of iconic uh, data analytics, data science textbooks. Um, you have guidance on software. So you know how to use the Notion API with Discord and Python, um, laptop hardware decisions. So you've got quite a variety there. What inspires you to make your particular topic choices when you're thinking about creating a video? Usually it is something I see missing in my YouTube channel. Um, it's something that I just happen to pick up and then I want to teach people. You know, I, I usually pick something up, learn it myself, and then try and teach people how to you know, do the same thing in a very practical way. Um, and oftentimes it's inspired by like questions, right? So like one of them was the laptop hardware video, right? Where, you know, my opinion on laptop hardware is that it doesn't really matter. Um, for like 90% of analytics tasks, like any, any basic laptop will do. Uh, just make sure you have at least eight gigabytes of RAM um, and a decent CPU, uh, which, you, you know, you'd have a hard time buying a bad one in today's market. Um, so a lot of my videos are, are an effort to try and tell people that like, stuff is easier than it seems. And, you know, here's like, here's the fastest way to get into it. Here's the fastest way to like get a job with these skills. Um, I try and always coach what or couch whatever I do in uh, the context of like getting a job because uh, I wouldn't call myself an academic by any means. Um, you know, I like learning, but I'm not an academic. I don't like, um, I, I like doing activity and doing work that, der that derives some specific economic value. Um, you know, AKA going to the office and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really couch my videos in like those terms. What can you do? Like what skills can you learn to quickly build up your ability to get a job? Um, right. And then when you're in the job, that that's the best practice you can possibly get. Mm -hmm. that, that's usually how I think about yeah. you know, what videos I come out with. Today's show is brought to you by Datalore, the collaborative data science platform by JetBrains. Datalore brings together three big pieces of functionality. First, it offers data science with a first-class Jupyter Notebook coding experience in all the key data science languages, Python, SQL, R, and Scala. Second, Datalore provides modern business intelligence with interactive data apps and easy ways to share your BI insights with stakeholders. And third, Datalore facilitates team productivity with live collaboration on notebooks and powerful no-code automations. To boot, with Datalore, you can do all this online, in your private cloud, or even on-prem. Register at datalore.online slash SDS and use the code SUPERDS for a free month of Datalore Pro and the code SUPERDS5 for a 5% discount on the Datalore Enterprise Plan. So get the job and then make a commercial impact early once you get the job. Exactly, exactly. Um, because I think a lot of people, you remember that show, um, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Yeah. Um, so it, I, when I, I, that show came out when I was in fifth grade. Um, you know, and it was really funny because I remember like, oh, yeah, like how could an adult not be as smart as a fifth grader? Now, being an adult, I totally get it. Um, <laughs> you just forget 90 percent of the things you learn in school, right. um, not to devalue the importance of school, but kind of to say, like, 
I'm really focused on teaching people stuff that they can keep for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, once you learn how to program once, you know, hopefully you never forget it again. Um, you know, SQL, Python, uh, Tableau, um, the basic framework that you use to analyze what laptop should I pick? This kind of stuff is skills that are useful for, you know, the next 20 to 30 years of your life, maybe. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So it sounds like you've identified a way of, uh, thinking of videos that are going to be practical and are going to provide people with tips that they can use for years and years to come. Uh, sounds hugely useful. Um, so across your videos, all the guidance that you have on the skills that are needed to be a data analyst, what do you think are the top technical skills that are must haves to be a data analyst? That's an interesting question. I think, um, and when I say must haves, let me also be clear that like there are jobs that don't require these skills. Um, and there are some jobs that you can go into that they'll teach you the skills from day one. But um, I think in order to, here's a better way to put it, the must have skills to be a senior data analyst. Basically, if you want to advance in the industry, what do you have to have? Mm -hmm. um, I would say some BI tool, Tableau, Power BI, you know, they're basically all the same. Um, SQL, you have to know SQL. Uh, and then Python is a very nice to have um, where you do no data analyst job I've seen requires that you know Python, right. but they will all, uh, you can convince people to pay you more and right. you can drive more value. You know, if you can drive more value, that's how you convince people to pay you more um, by knowing a programming language like Python. Um, and then Excel, I, I would say like, you know, pivot tables, um, uh, VLOOKUPs, HLOOKUPs. Uh, again, this is all stuff that can be learned in a weekend. So um, out of all of those skills, SQL is the only one that you can't learn in one weekend. So that's why I think anyone can be a data analyst because Tableau and Excel are things that you could give someone a weekend and just tell them like, don't go out with your friends. Don't go out. Don't do anything else. Just study this for a weekend. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So one weekend yeah. of Tableau, another weekend of SQL, another weekend of Excel, and then you're in pretty good shape for your data analyst interviews. And then once you get that, that data analyst job, you might want to start working on your Python. Uh, right. And, uh, and developing that out either on the job or maybe on your weekends once you start. You, you might need two weeks of uh, SQL, but yeah, yeah. Nice. Two weekends. I say two weeks. <laughs> two yeah, weeks. Two. Okay, okay. Yeah, what I've learned is that there's this really big mental barrier, and I used to have it too, right? There's a mental barrier for people uh, when they see text on a screen doing things um, instead of just saying things, right? And 90% of the time, text on a screen is just to say something to you. Warning message here. Microsoft Office document over here. Um, but when people start putting in commands into a computer to right. start telling the computer, when you start talking back to the computer that way, mm -hmm. um, there's some mental barrier, it's a weird mental barrier that people have, and I 100% had, that I think stops people from learning how to code. Um, because the basics of coding are very, very simple. They're not mm -hmm. hard at all. Um, mm -hmm. You could teach a, a fifth grader how to code like in Python over a weekend, like at the basic level. Right. Um, and now environment setup and stuff like that, yeah, no, that takes like a PhD level person to figure out. Uh, environment setup is absolutely miserable. But um, the the thing, the reason I say SQL takes two weeks is because that mental barrier takes a while to get over. Some people get over it instantly. Right. Um, some people who are, if you're exposed to technology your entire life, you may be able to get over it more easily. Um, but the I, I keep kicking myself for not learning how to code in Python earlier. There's so much stuff I could have done when I was a teenager had I known how to code in Python. Mm. Um, but, you know, it, eventually you get over that barrier and then you're able to go from there. That's why I would say about two weeks for SQL. Nice. And SQL is a pretty good gateway drug for getting people into programming because it does, so structured querying language, it does have a bit of a human language feel to it because you kind yes. of, the way that you make commands, you're like, you know, select these columns from this database. It's quite a natural feeling thing. You can kind of see, you can convert the SQL language typically quite easily into human natural language. All right, to summarize those, the must-haves for being a senior data analyst are uh, a BI tool like Tableau, SQL and Excel, and then Python is hugely valuable, uh, is a nice to have as you get into that role. Um, all right, so that's hard skills. What about soft skills? What soft skills are needed, Shashank, in the analytics space? Honestly, John, I'm glad you asked that. That uh, It's a question that's not asked enough. Um, and I think it's because soft skills, one, soft skills, I, you know, as long as you're not a serial killer, no one cares about your soft skills for an entry level <laughs> job in, in the technical fields. Um, okay. So I went to Emory, which is a, a heavy business school. Like a lot of my friends are um, 
uh, B school people. Um, you know, for them, soft skills are very important. That's you know, it, and also the funny thing is it also like created a very high bar for what I expect out of people from a like soft skills interviewing perspective, which right. unfortunately the um, engineering world has disappointed me with. <laughs> um, but as far as what soft skills do you need? Um, so you can get into a company basically purely on your technical skills uh, at an entry level. If you want to advance your career, um, then you're going to need the soft skills. So one of the big ones is requirements gathering, um, which is the skill of going into uh, or, or hearing a problem from someone, right? right. And uh, being able to d- deep dive into what are the actual requirements we need, we have to have in order to solve this problem. Uh, that's a really big one. Mm-hmm. Um, one that is needed for basically any senior position in any company is project management. Um, because you as a data analyst are going to have to have engineers and data scientists do stuff for you as well. Um, and making sure that they actually get that stuff done in a timely manner is a very important skill to have. So project management, project management is, um, another really big one. Um, presentation skills, uh, are a big one as well. Prioritization. Um, and, and prioritization is a very interesting one, right? Because you're going to have to know how to prioritize tasks depending on who gave them to you. Uh, I've been in more than one situation where I've been given multiple tasks and only one of them could get done in a day. Um, But one was given by a director and one was given by, you know, someone who wasn't a director. Um, And even though it might have made more, it it might have made more business sense to do the task a non-director gave me, (laughs) uh, it gave me a lot more visibility in the company if I did what the director asked me to do. Um, That's kind of playing politics. It, it, you know, that's up to you how much you want to do that personally. Um, if you want to advance past a certain level, you, uh, past a senior level, you do have to play politics. Um, that's why they call senior analysts, senior engineers. These are what you call terminal positions. Um, i.e. they're the position that someone could stay at for 10 years and no one would blink an eye. They'd be like, oh yeah, that guy, you know, he's been an analyst for 10 years, a senior analyst for 10 years. Now, if you were an entry level analyst for 10 years, you would have been fired eight years ago. But you know, right. um, you get, because there are certain positions you have to advance. Otherwise people are like, what is this person doing? Um, and so if you want to advance past that terminal position, right, then you're going to, th- these soft skills become like extremely important. All right. So you mentioned that the soft skill uh, bar that you have to clear for an entry level data analyst role is pretty low. Uh, you're saying that it's basically non-existent, but then once you do get that entry level data analyst role to become more senior, there are skills like requirements gathering, project management, presentation skills, and prioritization that are all critical to becoming a senior data analyst. And then you described a senior data analyst position as potentially being terminal. You could be stuck there for a decade, but you, Shashank, you transitioned from being a data analyst two years ago to a role at Nordstrom where you got to do a lot of data science work. And then most recently, you became a data engineer for a digital sports company called Fanatics. So. What is the difference between these roles, data analyst, data scientist, data engineer? And it seems like there is a reasonably common progression from analyst, scientist to engineer. So um, how did you make that transition? Why is that transition so common? And what tips do you have for listeners to get out of a terminal senior data analyst position into one of those other kinds of roles? Oh, it's, an, it's a very interesting question. Um, one more soft skill I would add. Um, if you're entry level, willingness to learn, uh, you need to be able to show that very willingly. Um, right. I feel like I need to add that in there because the, the thing is, when, when you leave college, right, you, you, you've you spent the last, what, 16 years, uh, I'm assuming a bachelor's degree, you spent the last 16 years being schooled, right? Uh, and you would hope you come out of that knowing a bunch of stuff and like being able to like, you know, show your knowledge. That's not what people are looking for from entry level candidates. They're looking that you are willing to learn because it turns out those last 16 years aren't actually that useful. Um, your, your learning starts today. Um, so one more soft skill I'd add there. Kind of going to the question you just asked about transitioning from data analyst to scientist to engineer and um, why that would be a common path. I think for me, the I don't know if it's a super common path. I, I know of only a couple of people who have made that transition who don't have master's degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, and people who go from science to engineering, I, that transition I've seen, I'll, I'll kind of get into that in a second. So we'll go from analyst to scientist first and uh, talk about that. So most people who I know who, I know who are data scientists um, have master's degrees. Um, it is a highly, I would say, like a mentally rigorous position. Um, and it, it, it's a position, like being a data scientist is a role where you will spend like 
maybe 60% of your day just deep in thought. You need to be able to think deeply for long stretches of the day, uh, more so than engineering, more so than uh, analytics. Um, that's that's what makes a data scientist a data scientist. And I'm, I'm kind of guessing that's why the master's degree is like a soft requirement uh, mm-hmm. to get into the field. Now, I don't have a master's degree and I, I didn't really intend on getting one after, I, at least for data science, after I talked to a bunch of data scientists and they were like, I mean, yeah, it like was helpful to get past a recruiter, but like I don't use my master's degree at all in this job. Uh, and then I looked mm. at the work they were doing and I was like, no, I mean, I can do that work. Like I don't need a master's degree for that. So I'm not going to go, you know, e- even if the company pays for my degree, it's it's a lot of my time and effort that's spent doing that, that I could spend doing something else, you know? Right. Um, and so the transition was helpful because it uh, get, data analysts do not require a master's degree, um, like at all. Um, and it allowed me to get into the company and it put me in the same basic, um, uh, zone as a data scientist that allowed me to like pick up work by myself that was able to show my boss, Hey, look, I'm doing data scientist work. I have like, cause you have access to all the databases. Uh, you, you know, you have access, you can get uh, computers that are unlocked. Um, uh, that's a really big one. Uh, a lot of business people there, they can't install apps on their laptops. Um, engineering orgs allow people to in, install apps on their laptops. Otherwise they just wouldn't be able to get work done. Right. Um, so being an analyst, you get that kind of a laptop, right? So I was able to like just install Python on my laptop and show them a bunch of stuff I was doing, um, which is probably why that transition exists, right? It is a way for you to, uh, it's a low risk thing for the company. Like let's say you're leaving a master's degree, they can hire you as an analyst, um, mm-hmm. keep you on for six months as an analyst and promote you to a data scientist. Low risk in the sense that you pay analysts about uh, two thirds of what you pay a data scientist. Right. Um, so if you're a data analyst making $100,000, an equivalent data scientist would be making at least 150 k um, mm-hmm. probably more, but at least 150 k um, And so that's why I think that transition exists. It, it, for the people who have master's degrees, it is an easy way for a company to judge someone's business acumen with, uh, in a relatively ro- low risk environment. And for the people who don't have master's degrees, it puts you in the basic space you need to be in, in order to show people that you have those data science skills. Um, and the job changes quite drastically. Again, like an, a data analyst is not a like it, it is a difficult job, but it is not a like mentally extremely rigorous job um, versus being a data scientist. Gotcha. And the reason for that is because a lot of your work as a data analyst is getting the business requirements together and getting people together and coordinating people mm-hmm. in order to actually um, you know pull together like a Tableau dashboard or something or pull together a SQL where you need to actually um, show the data to an executive versus a data scientist is like, okay, we do not know how much traffic is in our stores. I have this camera data. Maybe I can use that. Then you spend a month looking into the camera data, find out it's completely useless. Then you spend another month looking into another set of data, find out that that's actually very useful. Like, oh, we have Wi-Fi in our stores. We can use that to estimate and model out how many people are in the stores at any given time. That's a very mentally rigorous exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so that's why that transition exists. Now, why does the transition exist in data engineering? Um, there's a really common transition I've seen of data analyst to engineering. Um, data analyst what, engineering or data scientist? I've seen that too. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and that trend, transition exists for multiple reasons. Like one, first, yeah. let's get the, you know, let's, let's address the elephant in the room. Um, of kind of like the three major positions in the analytics world, data scientist, analyst, and engineer. There are many more. They're like ML ops, DevOps, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. these are like the three really big ones, right, that yeah. most companies will have. Yeah. Uh, analysts get paid the least. Um, and as IC roles, individual contributor roles, uh, they will continue to be paid the least on average. Um, a data scientist and a data engineer of equivalent level will basically always make more money. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the elephant in the room. Why do people transition? There you go. Um <laughs> It's, it's, uh, and I find a lot about like corporate America and a lot about like learning these uh, new skills. It's like temporary pain, glory forever. Um, because people are, I've talked to analysts and they're like, oh no, I don't want to like learn Python. It's too hard. But it's like, if you enjoy that temporary pain, eventually it becomes easy. And then it's just as easy as every other skill was for you. Um, but now you're making way more money. I I see no, I see no loss here. Um, (laughs) I see no reason not to do it. Um, especially for people who enjoy that challenge. Exactly. Yeah. Well, even if you don't enjoy the challenge, everyone enjoys more money, you know? Um, <laughs> th- th- that's what I don't understand. Like, I- I- I've had this conversation with a lot of analysts, and I'm like, do you not want to make more? Um, and-, and I'm not talking like, oh, you're making $500,000, let's get you to $600,000. i am talking like, you're making $100,000, let us get you to one hundred and fifty. Like, at a point where that difference still is, is you know, pretty can be pretty life-changing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but yeah, the uh, I've noticed a transition from engineering, I mean, from analytics into engineering mm-hmm. because of uh, people who um, get frustrated that they can't get access to data um, mm-hmm. as an analyst, mm-hmm. and so they move into engineering to solve those issues. Um, and I find that analysts who turn into engineers make some of the best engineers uh, because they because they they were the end customer at one day, um, right. or not the end customer, they were uh, the middle customer uh, at one point in time. So they they understand, you know the pains of analysts and like what they need, what help they need, you know? That is cool. That is a great perspective. Um, I don't think I've heard that perspective on the show before, but it makes perfect sense to me. What do you think about the Super Data Science Podcast? Every episode, I strive to create the best possible experience for you, and I'd love to hear how I'm doing at that. For a limited time, we have a survey up at superdatascience.com slash survey where you can provide me with your invaluable feedback on what you enjoy most about the show and critically about what we could be doing differently, what I could be improving for you. The survey will only take a few minutes of your time, but it could have a big impact on how I shape the show for you for years to come. So now's your chance. The survey is available at superdatascience.com survey. That's superdatascience.com survey. All right, so you've talked about why people make transitions from data analyst to data scientist or to data engineer. Um, but what are the key differences between these roles? I guess you've talked about that a bit. So um, data analyst might not be writing uh, code in a programming language like Python. So maybe they're writing SQL queries to extract data, um, but they're typically not programming. Um, I guess a data scientist will also typically be creating models. You mentioned that a bit. So the data analyst is analyzing data, creating charts, summary data, understanding business requirements, and being able to communicate those. A data scientist can build a model that can take new data that it hasn't seen before and make predictions. So that's probably like a key difference between data analyst and data scientist. Uh, And then I guess the key distinction between data analyst and data engineer that you talked about is that uh, the data engineer, again, because of those more developed programming skills, say in Python, is able to then extract data more themselves. Maybe they can be building data-driven applications or applications that incorporate machine learning and be getting those into production, which is a big difference from, you know, as a data analyst, you're not uh, programming production applications. Yeah, I would say that's a pretty good summary of um, the differences. Uh, The way I like to think about it, right, is in the pipeline of work, right? And, and no matter what I say, I want to make it very clear that all these positions are very, very necessary and they all drive a lot, like tremendous value. Mm-hmm. Um, and any well-functioning analytics org will need all three of them at least. Um, in differing numbers, you know, the, there's different theories as to how many engineers you should have per scientist, how many scientists you should have per analyst, stuff like that. Um, but I like to see it this way. Like you start off with a data engineer, they go ahead and uh, get the data ready for everyone else to use. And from there, the data can go straight to a data analyst, um, reporting on revenue, uh, uh, regulatory reporting, stuff like that can all be built by the analysts. Um, if you want to know something that the data doesn't directly say, that's where you send the data to the data scientist. And the data scientist can go ahead and build a model and say, okay, like given this information, we can assume or we can uh, predict that XYZ is going to happen. Um, and then from there, usually what I would do is I would suggest that you give your data scientist work to a data analyst. Um, this is not done enough, in my opinion. But I think if you pair a data scientist and a data analyst together, you get a winning combo because the data scientist is so uh, engulfed in the work that they're doing that presentation skills are not always top tier. Mm -hmm. Um, But a data analyst has to have top tier presentation skills as part of the Mm -hmm. job. Um, And a data data analyst gets like regular practice presenting uh, because their their development cycles are usually shorter. Um, It takes less time to build out Tableau dashboards than it does to build up machine learning models. and because of that, I think pairing a data scientist and a data analyst together, where the data scientist builds the model and the data analyst um, uh, builds out the charting mechanisms in order to actually uh, monitor that model and uh, make sure that people understand what's going on, um, is a winning combo. So that's another way I see it. Like there's that chain of order where it goes from data engineer to analyst or data engineer to scientist to analyst. Nice. Yeah, that's an insightful perspective that I hadn't thought about before. But yeah, I can see how that data analyst, data scientist combo could be particularly effective in a business setting. Nice. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So we've talked about your transition into data engineer. Let's dig into that a bit more. So what do you do in your current role as a data engineer at Fanatics? 
Yeah, so um, so Fanatics is a parent org. I actually work in a company called Bet Fanatics, which is underneath it. Um, it's a sports betting startup. That's part of the Fanatics, um, you know, greater umbrella. So, as a data engineer, part of the reason I joined Bet Fanatics, and one of the most exciting things about being here is that uh, when I joined, there was basically zero infrastructure; nothing existed. Um, and so it was a great opportunity to uh, safely, because you know, Fanatics is a, a at minimum twenty seven billion dollar valued company. Um, cool. uh, it's privately owned, uh, but a minimum wow. is twenty seven billion dollars. Um, that is backing up this venture to get into, you know, bet fanatics. So, uh, or to get into sports, uh, betting. And so I know like payroll won't be a problem. I'll be paid and everything. Uh, but I get to work, uh, on the ground floor with a group of extremely talented people. So, uh, what do I actually do right now? It's a lot of data modeling, building out what we think the data has to look like in order to, um, satisfy regula- re- regulators um, with our regulatory reporting and everything mm-hmm. and uh, what we think will be necessary for us to you know build out lines and stuff like that in the future um, and making sure that we're able to integrate our systems with any vendors who might be giving us data um, upstream and um, setting up the rules and functions for our AWS implementation or Amazon Web Services cloud implementation to make sure that the uh, data scientists and data analysts have an easy time putting together everything that they need in order to, you know, analyze their data. Well, it sounds like a super cool role, Shashank. Uh, it's amazing to have that kind of uh, scenario where you don't have to worry about getting paid, but you still get to work on a startup-like project that has enormous potential to scale. It sounds really exciting. Mm-hmm. It does remind me of the scenario that I have with my company, Nebula, and you don't come across it very often. And so if listeners find a situation like that where you can be in a startup atmosphere um, or maybe even a completely independent subsidiary that's being set up as a as part of a larger profitable holding company. That can be a really ideal situation for working in because um, you have so much upside potential without that risk of having to worry about whether you're going to get a paycheck uh, in the future. Um, so that's awesome. So I know that Beth Fanatics is um, specifically focused on sports betting. The broader company. Uh, Fanatics is involved in the sports industry more generally. Uh, Mm -hmm. For our listeners, do you have any insight into how data are embedded in the sports industry today and how it could be transforming the sports industry of the future? It's a really interesting question. So actually, I'm able to answer this more because um, back when I was doing the whole two jobs thing during the early pandemic, um, one of my clients was uh, worked in the NBA. and it was interesting, all the like data that they have available over there. So there's this thing called Second Spectrum, which is uh, a, a series of cameras they have in stadiums. And I don't know if they have it in all the NBA stadiums, but they have them in like at least some of them, uh, like the Golden State Warriors, for example. Um, and basically, it's a series of cameras that can track every single player movement and can tell you exactly what play is being is like happening at any given time. Um, as a bit of a side note, the funny thing is I feel like you could use that information to create a, a sports caster. Um, that actually like announces games uh, and is able right. to like, you, you know, and I, I don't think it would replace a human because like there are may, what there may be like 10 sportscasters in the NBA, like they're highly talented individuals with great personalities. Like there's no um, developing an algorithm that could do that would cost millions of dollars. Why would you do that? Just pay these people, you know, it's, it's way cheaper to just do it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, you know, you can only imagine what you could do with the kind of data that says, uh, you know, player A swiveled 38 degrees in this direction. Uh, and then pass the ball to player B. Um, you know, then player B went for a layup. Player C uh, came and you know shut him down. Um, l- like a system that's able to tell you all those plays, like has an incredible potential um, for people who are able to get access to that data. So, I, I funny thing is, I think that sports betting actually could get a lot more interesting right. as people uh, are able, if people are able to get access to like this kind of like really hardcore data on how like. Mm -hmm. systems like that work um Mm -hmm. one very interesting thing that i I can uh think about is a lot of the sports books will have um like mid-game bets where like uh i don't know let's say you're playing baseball like will this specific player be uh, struck out you know at this point in time um which is a lot of fun right the the logic of sports betting from a um uh what is its benefit to society perspective is that it makes the game more enjoyable for the fans when you know if you say, I bet you the Cowboys are going to win and there's nothing riding on that bet, there's no, if there are no stakes, it's not interesting uh, beyond, you know, just, you know, fandom for the team. 
uh, putting stakes on it or what makes it interesting. It's why, you know, poker's fun, um, but not when you play with no money. So I think um, when I'm, I'm trying to kind of connect how you have like amazing data sets, like a second spectrum that exists that I don't believe people currently use um, in their betting algorithms. Now it might be because getting access to that data is uh, it's usually like gated access. Um, but I think that you have the obvious examples of uh, taking a lot more data, applying it to sports betting, or even um, doing things like uh, predicting player injuries might be a specific thing, right? Like let's take the NBA or the NFL, for example. Um, concussions are a major problem in the NFL. What right. if there was a way to, d- based on the uh, positioning of the players on the field, you right. could say this position leads to more injuries, re- leads to more concussions and more players. Um, maybe that should be something that we watch out for. Or, you know, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know if concussions are one of those things that if they're treated very early, um, people oh, are Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Especially because if you don't know the person has had a concussion and you put them back out on the field, they can get another mm-hmm. one that makes the effects way more severe. So, yeah. So that kind of modeling to be able to say, based on the velocity and positioning of these players, there's a high risk of a concussion here. And, mm-hmm. you know, they should, they have to undergo some test before they can be put back up in the field. Um, yeah, or helmet sensors and stuff like that, right? So mm-hmm. I, I think with um, when it comes to sports, a lot of the interesting data and a lot of the interesting effects that data will have on the industry are going to come through really cool hardware that's being built out. You know, sensors that add no weight to a helmet, but it can, you know, um, detect the shock that a player is going through uh, mm-hmm. and communicate that immediately. Um, you know, you, you have the obvious example of like Microsoft Surfaces being used all over, um, you know, the NFL right now instead yeah. of pen and paper. Mm-hmm. Um, how much that's improved teams. I'm not exactly sure if that's really done much, but you know, um, it, it's there. So yeah. I, I think the opportunity exists and, and, and having worked, uh, kind of like tangentially to the industry with that uh, contract I had with the NBA person, mm-hmm. um, I can definitely say that, uh, there's a lot of like old dude thinking in sports, um, right. and a lot less data is being used than you think is being used. So, um, and a lot of data is still pen and paper data. So I can't be specific as to exactly what it is, but there's a very popular event that's held every year um, where all the results for the last whatever number of decades are taken in pen and paper. Um, hmm. No one has turned this into a digital data set yet. L- like it's a really, really old man's industry uh, when it comes to data. <laughs> like people talk about like the Golden State Warriors, and all the data they use and everything. And I mean, sure, they use some, but it's not impressive in my opinion. Um, so, um, you know, th- there's opportunities in there if you can get in. Yeah, interesting. Uh, those are some great insights. I'm glad I asked the question. And it sounds like there is a huge amount of opportunity to be digitizing information um, beyond what is currently being digitized, you know, notwithstanding examples like the second spectrum example that you gave in the NBA. Um, but yeah, so still lots of opportunities in sports to be digitizing things. And then even where we are collecting a lot of data, we're just at the very beginning of what we could be doing with modeling. And yeah, hopefully we can. Um, not only be coming up with better predictions about sports outcomes, but also hopefully doing things like avoiding serious injuries like concussions in the NFL. Very mm-hmm. cool. Um, so um, we've talked about your roles at the companies that you've worked at. Uh, earlier in the episode, you talked about FANG companies, these kind of the big tech companies, which I guess mm-hmm. today, uh, even if you don't like the uh, meta name, you could abbreviate them as like MAMA. So like, yeah, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Alphabet. Um, and so uh, doing data analysis at a company like Nordstrom that you were at uh, previously, uh, relative to doing data analysis at a company like Google, there's got to be some big differences there. So you've spoken uh, previously on other shows about the big divide in data maturity between data digital native companies like Google and those coming from older industries, and I guess to, to your point about, you know, these uh, old man industries uh, in sports, so those kinds of companies as well, they're even further behind, way behind companies like Nordstrom. Um, so, yeah, so we've got this big divide between data digital native companies like Google and other companies from older industries for whom analytics is just a support function. So can you elaborate on this big divide and what could be done to close that gap? Um, you know, show me your, show me your budget and I'll show you what you are as a company. Um, the big divide comes in budget more than like that. That's where everything starts. Um, if you're at the end of the day, engineering is expensive. Um, 
it is not, it's not something that you can, you know, just spend a couple million dollars. Like you're going to spend tens of millions of dollars on this. Right. Um, there is a, and, and the companies like, you know, Google, Apple, Amazon, you know, these companies, um, Facebook and all, they, because it's so core to what they do, they're willing to spend just tons of money on engineers, on analysts, on scientists. Um, and as such, I think because they spend so much money on engineers, they also just store a lot more of their data in formats that can be easily, um, you know, retrieved right. and allow analysts to easily, you know, go look into the data and find out what's going on and, um, you know, find interesting correlations and, you know, potential causations that exist in that data. Right. So I, I would say the biggest divide are, pro, are, are a couple of things. Um, it probably all comes down to budget initially. Like everyone wants to hire the 10X developer. The 10X developer is only going to go work for, you know, 200 plus a year though. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, who has the money to hire someone for $200,000 plus per year plus stock? You know, it's going to be uh, these um, uh, really large fang companies. And the, you know, fact of the matter is their businesses are so profitable um, that they can afford to give their employees free lunch you know, every single day of the week. Um, well, yeah, only a couple of them. But, uh, you, know, buy, you know, build these huge campuses in these extremely expensive parts of the country, um, pay engineers, uh, you know, if you're talking Netflix, 500 plus per year uh, in cash compensation. Right. Um, and, and, you know, the engineering salaries, they, they trickle down to everyone else as well. Like, you know, data scientists get paid, you know, some, I don't know about 500, but data scientists get paid in the ballpark of that. Uh, analysts get paid less, but their pay is higher at companies like, like Netflix because, they're part of the tech org, right? right. Um, so yeah, I, I would say probably just comes down to budget um, and and how much are companies willing to spend on this uh, kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I, in my opinion, budget is quite honestly where it all comes down to. Like how much are you willing to spend on this? And you know, what what drives value in your org? I, I always like to tell people, if, you are, if you're going to ever take up a position, try and go to a company where your job is one of the most valued jobs out there. Um, I have a lawyer friend, right? And I asked him, is he ever interested in doing like uh, corporate law? And he says not, or sorry, if he, is he interested in doing um, in, in-house counsel? And he's like, right. not really. Um, in-house counsel, like nothing wrong with it. But like, it's not like the, the cutting edge of law is happening at law firms, you know, companies right. that like, you know, they, that's what they do. They work in law, um, you know, and the equivalent works with analysts uh, being part of the tech org. You want to work at either a tech company or a tech first company. Um, so there are three types of companies when it comes to a, like, you know, if you're a tech person, right? Uh, tech companies, tech first companies, and non-tech companies. Um, Nordstrom, you know, amazing company. It's not a tech company. Um, you know, at its core, revenue is generated from in, you know, in-person stores. And that's where the company started. Um, uh, Apple, Apple is 100% a tech company. At, like all of their revenue is generated from selling technology uh, and technology products. Bet Fanatics is what I call a tech first company. Um, it's primarily a sports betting company. Um, but it's a sports betting company with a heavy, 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 heavy focus on, uh, being the industry leaders through a better tech product, you know? And so those are the companies that, you know, uh, the tech first and tech companies that are willing to pay their analysts the most money. Um, mm -hmm. and as such, when you pay people more money, there's generally going to be an increase in performance. You're going to get better candidates. Um, you're going to get like the top 10% of candidates, top 5% of candidates. Uh, one of my friends works at Willis Towers Watson, um, amongst other things, they do HR consulting. And he was kind of telling me, he, he puts together pay packages for people. And he says, yeah, yeah, no, like not everyone, not every company is looking for the top candidates. Like, why would they? Because if you want to hire the top candidates, you have to pay top dollar. Um, right. Companies decide, okay, this function of our job, how much do, do we want to pay? Um, I was interviewing for a position at a major consulting firm, um, and it would be a highly technical position. And what I found out is that this company, um, amongst basically all the consulting companies, uh, I'm sorry, along with all the other consulting companies, they basically put all of their analysts and engineers in like uh, a warehouse in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and the consultants who are, again, are the breadwinners for the company, they uh, dump the work on the analysts and the engineers, and then the engineers and analysts in their warehouse have to come go finish it. Um, you know, you get paid decently well, but you, you know, you're not respected in the way that a consultant is. You know, don't go work at... Um, McKinsey, Bain, Deloitte, unless you're working as a consultant, you know? Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That all makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, so a lot of really valuable tidbits there. A lot of great insight, Shashank, that you have into uh, the marketplace for people working in data roles across a broad range of, across a broad range of industries. 
um, and then crystal clear that it's a budget <laughs> that divides digital native companies from everyone else. And so, yeah, if those other companies want to catch up, you're going to have to pay. There's no shortcut uh, to getting that level of digitization and modeling and know-how. Um, it's just money. I mean, and I'd like to put it this way, like engineering is new investment banking. Um, back in the 80s and, you know, to an extent, the 90s, um, if you wanted to make a ton of money and you didn't want to spend all your, like a ton of time in school, you know, to become like a doctor or a lawyer or something, uh, you became an investment banker. Uh, and even today, you can make a lot of money being, being an investment banker. Um, today, it's software. You, if you work in software, those are the people that make just the, the most money in America um, without being in school forever, you know? Right. Um, and even I, I'd argue if, if, if as an engineer or, well, yeah, as an engineer um, or a data scientist, if you put in the amount of effort that, you know, medical school students put in, you'll make more money than any doctor in America makes. Um, right. Right. Because they, they don't start making sure. money until they're like 30 plus. Yeah. Um, and then even then it's, you know, it's such a heavily regulated industry. There are only so many ways you can make money. You can't, mm -hmm. um, you can have two jobs as an engineer. You can't really have two jobs as a doctor cause you have to, you know, physically be there for people. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could have, uh, relatively soon out of school. If you put the level of effort that somebody put into medical school mm -hmm. into your role as a data engineer, a data scientist, you could be making the kind of half million uh, Netflix income that you're describing while on the side, getting your startup off the ground. Exactly. Um, that could mean by the time you're in your mid thirties, finishing your radiology residency or whatever, and finally getting mm -hmm. paid six figures and you've got all that medical school debt, you could instead be retired. <laughs> and that's why I tell people, right? If you want to be, if you want to make money, don't become a doctor. You, you need to become a doctor for the, for the passion of um, medicine. Um, because software is a much more efficient way to do that. And it, it yeah, it's, I, I have friends that like are in medical school and the, if, if you put in the amount of effort that they put in to medical school, you would be a 10 X developer instantly. You, you, you would be the top 10% of developers easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Um, all right. So, uh, you've had a lot of great insights into the industry. I'd love to hear if you have specific tool recommendations for our listeners. Uh, that would maybe accelerate their journey towards being that 10x developer, that 10x data scientist? Yeah. Um, okay. So for the major tools I work with, I work with Python, Tableau, and um, SQL. Mm -hmm. If you're learning Tableau, um, I have a video on my uh, YouTube channel on it, you know, Tableau, you know, learn it. This is what you do. Um, easy enough. You, you can learn basically everything about Tableau and uh, everything you can learn 90% of what you need to know in Tableau in about a weekend. When it comes to SQL, um, your select statements, um, group by, where, uh, window functions, um, if you know those, um, a DQL, data querying language, then you're basically good to go for any interview. Um, for Python, uh, make sure you learn. So Python, um, the way I like to describe it is data scientists and data analysts, um, or sorry, Python's like a tree, right? And an engineer knows the trunk of the tree, the, you know, the core of the language, you know, classes, functions, all that kind of stuff, right? Data scientists and data analysts, like, learn maybe a quarter of the trunk of the tree, and then they branch off into their own little world. Um, that's where you use Pandas, sklearn. Uh, my brother's like a software engineer, right? And so, you, you know, we've had discussions where, like, we can read each other's code, but we don't actually know what's going on because, right. you know, he knows all this really advanced, like, core library stuff. Um, but I know like all these specific libraries. Like he has no idea what sklearn is. I mean, you know, why should he? It's a very, very specific library, right? Yeah, for machine learning. Exactly, exactly. So uh, pandas for data um, uh, manipulation of tabular data. Um, mm -hmm. sklearn for machine learning. Mm -hmm. um, TensorFlow or PyTorch. PyTorch. You can use either for neural networks. Um, mm -hmm. I'd recommend doing that last though. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if you just know pandas and sklearn, then you're you know you're basically solid as like the basics of data science and uh, data analytics. Um, nice. And do I, do I remember from a call that you and I had earlier that the course that you used to teach yourself a lot of these Python skills was a super data science course by Kirill Aramenko, the old host? Yes. Super data uh, science? Specific, yeah, the machine learning one. Yes. Machine learning A to Z. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, I don't do data science work today, like, like full time. Um, but th the algorithms I learned in that course, I still apply. Like, I have a video coming out where I use like 
uh, K-means. And I, and I learned it from that course. And Carol puts it, like he like blazes through it, but in an appropriately fast way. He doesn't dwell too much on theory, but mm-hmm. enough to where you know what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, again, like I said, I'm not an academic. So uh, I, I don't care too much about the theory. I care about how this is practically used. And Carol's course very much like, yeah, that's exactly what happens. Nice. All right, cool. Yeah, so those are... Um similar to the recommendations that we had at the onset of this episode. So Tableau, SQL, Python, but it was nice to have you dig into more detail um, into the Python libraries that you think are most important. So Pandas, Scikit-Learn, and either TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, I'll actually, I'll also include, so we'll have in the show notes, we'll have your Tableau video that you mentioned. We'll have the Super Data Science Machine Learning A to Z Udemy course that Kirill made. And then I'll also, I'll provide a YouTube video um, on TensorFlow versus PyTorch and uh, considerations that you might want to have as you consider adopting one or the other. Nice. All right. So I understand from talking to you before the show that Bet Fanatics is doing a lot of hiring. So we you are. made it sound like a pretty awesome place to work during this episode, uh, given all the funding and the kind of startup atmosphere and the big scale up potential. So you're hiring data analysts, you're hiring data scientists, you're hiring data engineers, mm-hmm. um, and you're particularly looking for folks like that who have an interest in sports. Um, so um, Shashank, I know that you do a lot of interviewing. What do you look for in the people that you want to hire for roles like that? So we're looking for um, solid technical skills, first and foremost, right? Like, like it, there's no two ways about it. If you want to work in this um, field, you have to have solid technical skills. That's the most important thing. Um, after that, we're looking for the ability to work well as a team. Uh, we're not looking for heroes. We're not looking for 10x devs who you know are in their cocoon for a, an entire week and then come out with a genius solution that no one understands. Um, and we are looking for people who can really um, take on multiple roles. Um, and again, be compensated well to do that. Like, whenever anyone says take on multiple roles, make sure you're being compensated well enough to you know justify that. Um, as a bit of a side note, I'm a huge advocate of like, you know, people being paid what they deserve to be paid. Um, and I think at BetFanatics, we're, we're quite good about that. Uh, we are, what do you mean? Like what kinds of multiple roles? Like, what do you mean? They're like, so they'd be doing data analytics and data engineering, for example. Is that what you mean? uh, Right. You know, I, I think you, you could drive a lot more value doing that. So for example, if you go take a job at Amazon, right. Um, you could, you know, spend 10 years at Amazon, never touch Tableau as a, actually, I don't know if Tableau's part of their stack, but never touch a BI tool as an engineer. Um, Here, I mean, you you could, but you could, it is really easy for you to drive a lot of value by building out a Tableau dashboard, you know, Um, or seeing that like, oh, maybe this code isn't written as like well as it could be written uh, as an analyst uh, and then pointing that out or like as an analyst pointing out, hey, there's a different AWS service we could be using for this exact same thing. in a startup, the opportunities to do that are, are significantly higher. Nice. Yeah, sounds great. All right, so solid technical skills, work well on a team, and be willing to take on multiple roles and then get compensated mm-hmm. for that adaptability. Um, awesome. So yeah, so look out for those opportunities, listeners, um, if you're looking uh, for a great company, and particularly if you're interested in sports. Um, so uh, earlier this week at the time of recording, I asked my social media followers if they had questions for you. I told them that you were coming up uh, to be interviewed. And I didn't exactly get questions, uh, but I did get a lot of comments about you, and some of which will spur discussion. So Richard, for example, who's an associate data scientist at a company called HealthStream, he says that he loves your live streams, Shashank. So that's something that we haven't even talked about yet on the program. So maybe you could fill us in on those YouTube live streams a bit. Um, And then Richard also um, asked to have you fill us in on your experience with the data crew, which I assume is going back to talking about Ken at the beginning of the episode. I think it's kind of the crew that he's put together for, you know, getting you guys physically together, a whole bunch of content creators uh, in a house all together and recording lots of content. I assume that's what he's talking about. Yes. Um, so that was a very interesting uh, experience to have. So, um, yeah, I, I guess kind of going to the live stream first. Live stream, um, 8 a.m. Pacific time every Thursday. Uh, I didn't do one this week, but 
it, it happens basically every week. Uh, I just answer whatever questions people might have. Um, as far as the data crew, that was a lot of fun. It, it's a great opportunity to meet with not just data professionals, but like people who also like do stuff outside of their main jobs. Um, you know, 90% of people I meet, and, and honestly, this is the way it should be, right? 90% of the people I meet, you know, their day job is that that's what they do. That's all the productivity they have in a day um, from like a, you know, data perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and not at all criticizing that. that. That is how the world should work. Um, most people should do their nine to five and then go live life after that. Um, but it was really cool to like meet. It's really fun to meet people who also are out there making content, trying to help people teach. Um, and it's a group of friends that like understand like kind of the struggles of making content um, that, you know, I just don't get in other situations, you know? So I, I, for me, that was kind of the coolest part about being a part of that. Um, and again, they're all just like really cool people. It, it's a self-selecting group of very hard workers. Um, and it's really funny because like, you, you know, you'll have like people like Tina and stuff constantly talk about how lazy she is. And I'm like, yeah, Tina Huang. Yeah, Tina Huang. I'm like, you, you have to be one of the hardest workers I know. Like <laughs> you are by definition, extremely hardworking, um, you know, because yeah. you, were, you were doing your job and doing your YouTube channel at the same time. Yeah, um, it's true. She, she right? is incredibly industrious and she does talk about how lazy she is. She does that. In fact, on Super Data Science episode number 563, she's our guest on that episode. <laughs> and I mean, she talks about how, I guess what she's kind of referring to there is that um, she has a tendency towards laziness, but as she talks about frequently on her YouTube channel, she has developed tricks, habits that spur her out of that innate laziness, I guess, and mm-hmm. result in her being incredibly industrious. Yeah. And I mean, there's something to learn from that, right? Like, I, yeah, I guess um, being industrious is like not, it, it's not, it doesn't just come to everyone. Some people have to like trick themselves into doing it, you know? Um, but as long as you get there, who cares how you got there, right? <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a really cool experience. Um, it, it's, it was really trippy because, so I've never really been into celebrity culture myself. Um, for me, my celebrities are YouTubers. Um, and, you know, like, like MKBHD, stuff like that. And, you know, one of those people was Ken G, because uh, I was watching his videos. Um, he, he very much has first mover advantage in this space in that he was one of the first people to come out with, like, YouTube videos on data science. Um, and I remember watching him, like, early in my career. Um, I, mean, I guess I still am early in my career, but, like, earlier in my career. And it was just trippy, like, you know, being, like, friends with him and, like, hanging out with him. Um, and, you know, just, like, shooting the shit with him about, like, you know, just life and everything instead of talking about data as well. So yeah, no, it's, it's an, it's an interesting, it was an interesting trippy moment to kind of like get to meet your heroes, you know? Um, nice. So, yeah. So is there a particular video that you recommend that we put in the show notes for listeners to watch about that time? Because Mark Moyu, uh, who's a senior data scientist at NVIDIA, uh, he also commented that he loves the video that you did with Kenji for the datathon, uh, so Mark says he was laughing and entertained the whole time. So, is there a particular video that you could point us in the direction of? It, it would probably be that one. So, there are two videos in relation to that. Um, yeah, what's it called? <laughs> oh, I, I think it's, it's called like the the Bright Data Iron Analyst Challenge. That was it. Yeah, Bright Data so, Iron Analyst Challenge. Nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, look up Iron Analyst Bright Data, and you'll see that. And then, if you go to my channel, um, you'll see me live streaming the entire event. So, basically, long story short. We're given a random data set and we're asked to analyze and build out a visualization of it um, and display it to a couple of judges. And um, I was the only one that like live streamed myself doing it. So you can see like the entire process I was going through. And it's, it, you know, it might seem contrived, but it, it's genuinely how the real corporate world works. Uh, it just squeezed down into two hours. So you right. can see me go through the entire life cycle of building on a dashboard in two hours of like, okay, what do I prioritize? Where do I get this data from? What can I do? What can I not do? Uh, what's realistic? What do the executives want to see? Stuff like that. Nice. And then, so that makes sense to the final comment that I'm going to read <laughs> off of the social media post that I made about you, which is from Mark Freeman. So he was also a guest on the podcast earlier this year. Uh, that was episode number 587. And Mark commented that he watched you build an entire interactive dashboard while live streaming in just a couple of hours. That must be what you're just describing for this uh, Bright Data Iron Analyst Challenge. And Mark says that you are next level in your data skills and your ability to communicate it. Uh, so uh, given the experience that we've had and how well you've been communicating concepts in this episode, that doesn't surprise me. But it's nice to hear that he can also vouch for the technical abilities that you've been floating uh, throughout this episode. So yeah, so live streams, on Shashank's YouTube channel, you can see the master in action um, using his broad range 
of skills that he's accumulated as a data analyst, performing data science work, and now as a data engineer. All right, Shashank, it's been awesome having you on the podcast. Um, before I wrap up episodes, I always ask for a book recommendation. Do you have one for us? Yes. Uh, my book recommendation is always storytelling with data um, for multiple reasons. Uh, is that Kate Strachny? Big... Sorry? Is that Kate Strachny's book? Uh, it's uh, Cole Nosbummer Naflick. Um, yeah, so yes. it's book, like, I think KN. Yeah, it's Naflick's book KN. So um, really great book. Highly recommend it. Um, and the reason is because it was, it was the first book I read as an analyst, but the deeper I get into the technical skills, the more I feel like it's important to pull myself back and understand that all data is storytelling. Like that, that's the purpose of all of it. Um, why does any of it exist? It exists to, you know, automate stuff and to tell stories. Um, and I believe that book does a great job communicating, you know, how do you do that effectively? And it's a book that anyone can read. If you do any kind of presentation at your job, which anyone of sufficient, um, hierarchy in an organization will be doing presentations. Um, it's a good book to read. Nice. And yeah, prior to me becoming host of the Super Data Science Podcast, so well, Kirill uh, Aramenko, whom we mentioned as uh, the creator of that machine learning A to Z course, well, he was still host of Super Data Science. He hosted Cole Nussbaumer Knaflik, uh, the author of that book that you just mentioned, uh, Storytelling with Data. And so that's episode number 395. Um, so listeners can check that out as well. It's a great recommendation. Thank you, Shashank. Um, all right. So obviously if people want to keep in touch with you after this episode, one great way to do that is to be following your YouTube channel, which we'll have links to in the show notes, uh, mm -hmm. including, uh, watching your live streams and interacting with you there. Uh, any other social media handles that listeners should be aware of for tracking your work and staying up to your latest? Probably LinkedIn is a good one. You can follow me on LinkedIn and, uh, I'll try and post there a little bit more often. That's probably the way to go though. Nice. All right. Um, Shashank, thank you so much for being on the Super Data Science Podcast. Thank you for getting up early to make it happen with us. Uh, it's been so much fun having you on the show. You're a delight to chat with. And yeah, look forward to catching up with you again in the future someday. I had a great time. Thank you for having me. What a jolly time I had with Shashank filming today's episode. In it, Shashank filled us in on how you can learn Tableau in a weekend and it will accelerate your capacity to provide business intelligence reporting as well as potentially be enough to land you an entry-level data analyst role. How Tableau, SQL, and Excel are the must-have hard skills for a senior data analyst position, while Python is a hugely valuable nice-to-have. How senior data analysts shine at requirements gathering, project management, presentation skills, prioritization, and their willingness to learn. How data analysts who become data engineers can be some of the best data engineers out there because they appreciate the needs of the folks who will be analyzing the data downstream. And how data manipulation with pandas, machine learning with scikit-learn, and deep learning with either TensorFlow or PyTorch are the critical Python library-based skills for data scientists. As always, you can get all the show notes, including the transcript for this episode, the video recording, any materials mentioned on the show, the URLs for Shashank's YouTube and LinkedIn, as well as my own social media profiles at superdatascience.com slash 623. That's superdatascience.com slash 623. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd greatly appreciate it if you left a review on your favorite podcasting app or on the Super Data Science YouTube channel. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. I also encourage you to let me know your thoughts on this episode directly by following me on LinkedIn or Twitter and then tagging me in a post about it. Your feedback is invaluable for helping us shape future episodes of the show. And if you'd like to engage with me in person as opposed to just through social media, I'd love to meet you this week at the Open Data Science Conference West. That's ODSC West. It's running in San Francisco from today through November 3rd. I'll be doing an official book signing for my book, Deep Learning Illustrated, and we'll be filming a Super Data Science episode live on the big stage with the world-leading deep learning and cryptography researcher, Professor Don Song, as my guest. In addition to those formal events, I'll also just be hanging around, grabbing beers and chatting with folks. It'd be so fun to see you there. All right. Thanks to my colleagues at Nebula for supporting me while I create content like this Super Data Science episode for you. And thanks, of course, to Ivana, Mario, Natalie, Serge, Sylvia, Zara, and Kirill on the Super Data Science team for producing another terrific episode for us today. For enabling this super team to create this free podcast for you, we are deeply grateful to our sponsors. Please consider supporting the show by checking out our sponsors' links, which you can find in the show notes. And if you yourself are interested in sponsoring an episode, you can find our contact details in the show notes, 
as well as by making your way to johncrone.com slash podcast. Last but not least, thanks to you for listening all the way to the end of the show. Until next time, my friend, keep on rocking it out there. And I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.